prophet Micah says, now it shall come to pass in the last days. So what are the last days? That implies, doesn't it, that somewhere, somewhere, someone has a purpose uh, which will come to an end. If you have a Bible, please have a look at Micah chapter 4 and verse 1. I'll read you a short section. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow to it. Many nations shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. To the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion the law shall go, go forth and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge between many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts hath spoken it. So that's, that quote is from the New King James Version of the Bible. And that's a wonderful scene that's presented to us there, isn't it? The picture that's painted for us is one of peace, uh, one of self-sustainability. Everyone has uh, the means to provide for his own livelihood. It's a time of justice, a time of peace and rest and freedom. Freedom from oppression, no more war. And it's also about the establishment of true worship, of right teaching and good governance. It's a picture of hope for the future. In the Bible, this, is, well, this time is referred to as the kingdom of God. Now, who wouldn't want to live in a world like that? And this is a picture of our world, which will certainly happen. Because it is the purpose of God. The mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. And there's nothing that can alter that. And this then is is the end story. It's the end of a purpose which God has had in place, in mind, since the very beginning. Just to turn right to the beginning of the Bible, have a look at Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, as I suspect we're aware, uh, describes the creation of the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form, and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And um, these, these early chapters of Genesis then describe to us the way in which God created the universe, in which he created the world in which we live, and everything in it, and how it's so perfectly ordered to fulfill his will, to fulfill his purpose. And these early chapters of Genesis then answer many of the fundamental questions we have about life. Where did the universe come from? How did life begin? What is the purpose of life? Why do we die? The answers are all here in just a few chapters at the beginning of our Bibles. Now, uh, the main reason I'm going to suggest to you why God created the world and why God in particular created men and women is shown to us in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. I'll just read those to you. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our own likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth. And over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So 
God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. That's a remarkable, powerful, powerful statement, it seems to me. Uh, it tells us that in the beginning, God created men and women in some way to be like the God who created them. They created in his likeness. In his image. What does that mean? Well, uh, the intention of the Heavenly Father then, the Lord God, was, was to, um, to make the, this first human pair, Adam and Eve, uh, as we find out they're, they're called, uh, to make them rulers over the whole world, everything that God had created. Um, and in verse 28, God blesses them and says to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion. So it's very strongly implied here, isn't it, then, that um, it was God's purpose to fill the earth with, with a family. A family of people who were like the God who created them. His family. People who shared those family characteristics of being in the likeness and the image of God. I'm going to suggest to you that to understand that, we have to know something of the Lord Jesus Christ, who we find was um, like God in, in, in that sense. But that's another story, really. We may pick that up in a, in a little while. Well, you might say, well, if... If then that's the reason that God created the world, to be filled with a, with, a, with a worldwide family of people who were in some way like, like the God who created them, what went wrong? Certainly the world today is nothing like that, is it? It's not filled with a worldwide family living at peace with each other uh, and who in some way share the characteristics of the divine father who, who created them, his, his personality, his, his character. What went wrong? Well, the problem was that, um, that the Heavenly Father gave that first couple the ability to choose, to choose whether to, to serve him or, or not. And uh, the stark fact is that they chose not to. They chose not to do what God wanted them to do, not to believe what he said. And we can read about that in Genesis chapter 3, how that happened. And that relationship then that uh, that God uh, created the, ma the man and the woman uh, to have with him, to be like him, was severely damaged. Damaged by sin, damaged by the breaking of God's law. Uh, and yet that original purpose still stands. It is still God's purpose um, to fill the world with a family, with men and women who were in some way like the God who created them. Because God's word always, um, always comes to pass. There's not an instance in the scripture where that hasn't happened to date. For example, we read then in Numbers chapter 14 and verse 21, as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Can you imagine that? All the earth being filled with the glory of the Lord. Well, how will that happen? Well, the answer, again, lies with our understanding of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, surprising, then, that we have to, we have to read through four-fifths of the Bible before we're introduced to him in purpose, in, in person. He, he's there in the purpose of God from the very beginning, and you can see that quite clearly. In fact, many of the New Testament scriptures refer back to um, Old Testament prophecies which predicted uh, about the, uh, the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. When, when the Lord Jesus uh, was born then, and he was born 
uh, as any other human person is born, descendant of Adam and Eve. That's described for us in the New Testament in two particular places. In Matthew chapter 1, which we're not particularly going to look at, Matthew chapter 1 says that the per one of the purposes to be fulfilled by the Lord Jesus was that he would save his people from their sins. He was going to reverse uh, that process of sin and death brought into the world in the beginning by the disobedience of Adam and Eve. The birth of the Lord Jesus is also described in, in Luke chapter 1. And the angel Gabriel then uh, comes with a message for his mother, for Mary, um, about the birth of this child. Luke chapter 1, verse 31. And behold, she was told, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Highest. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. How can that possibly be? How can anyone reign over a kingdom forever? Since the world began, that's never been seen, has it? And of his kingdom, there will be no end. And here it is then, the purpose of God to be fulfilled in a kingdom. The kingdom of God, which will be established on earth forever. That was the pro promise of the prophet Micah, way back there in uh, Micah chapter 4. Uh, and Mary said to the angel, how can this be? I don't know a man. And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. And so then the Lord Jesus is born as the Son of God and the Son of Man, the Son of, the son of a human being, the Son of the woman. And so um, Mary, of course, was of the royal line uh, of Israel. But Jesus preeminently was born as the Son of God. He then is the heir of all things. He has the right to rule, both as a human king, but also as God's appointed heir, as a divine heir over a kingdom which can last forever. Does that make sense? So then, can we just turn back to that reading we, we started with? Just have a look at that in a little bit more detail. Micah chapter 4, and verse 1. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days. So here then, there is a time, isn't there? That the things which we see around us, in today's world will come to an end. And this is foretold and has been foretold in the scripture. Shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains. It shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow to it. Many nations shall come and say, uh, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. <laughs> you know, that's a remarkable passage in scripture uh, because the Lord's house, the temple of God, uh, was originally built in Jerusalem. It was built um, by uh, the great King David's um, son, the, the, uh, the man who succeeded him on the throne of Israel. Uh, the man Solomon, the king Solomon, who built then a great and glorious temple for God to be worshipped in the place where heaven and earth met, uh, the dwelling place on earth of Almighty God. And that, that, that place is still there. It's in Jerusalem, isn't it? <laughs> the remarkable thing, of course, for us to consider is that on that very site, today, now, there is an Arab mosque, 
a Muslim mosque. And yet, this prophet is telling us that that will be the site once again of a great temple of God, a holy temple. People will flow to it to hear of the teaching from God. Well, how will, how will that happen? Well, of course, for that, for that to be fulfilled, the mosque will have to be removed. And it, it, it does seem to me that if anything was likely to trigger World War III, say, then that would be it, wouldn't it? That would be one of the factors, perhaps. But of course, that's, that's what the scriptures are, uh, are introducing us to, isn't it? There's, there's going to be a great conflict in the Middle East, and it will be centred at Jerusalem. This passage indicates that so there are many others in Scripture, Zechariah chapter 14, for example, Daniel chapter 12. A time of trouble such as never was. So that's not too, uh, too remarkable, perhaps, after all. And the nations, the nations round about then, are going to flow to Jerusalem to hear the true teaching of God. Now, that would be remarkable, wouldn't it? Uh, because Jerusalem today is not surrounded um, by, by Christian nations, um, by followers of people who think that Jesus is their saviour, who will save them from their sins. But the word of God is clear. The purpose of God will stand sure. And the true teaching will once again flow like a river to all nations of the world from the house of God in Zion. For out of Zion, um, the law shall go forth and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem and the word of the Lord, which we have today, is here in this book, our Holy Scripture. And that then um, will be the beginning, really. Not the end, the beginning. The beginning of a new and glorious age. An age of prosperity and peace, uh, which we can read of in, in other scripture. Revelation chapter 21 uh, is, a good, is a good place to look for that. Isaiah chapter 35 also. Daniel 2 verse 44. Great passages of scripture uh, revealing to us how the purpose of God will be fulfilled here on the earth. As the words of the Master said, the meek shall inherit the earth. And they shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. So then, um, the purpose of God to be fulfilled in his kingdom is not some kind of... Um, ideological concept, um, something that will happen gradually um, in the world as, as people begin to understand uh, this purpose of God and what it means to them. No, it's a purpose that has a definite uh, point in history where the old order will be swept away and the new order will be brought in. It's a purpose that is sure because it's the purpose of God. Jesus will return to be king. He's seated now at God's right hand in heaven. Psalm 110 tells us that. He will raise the dead. Those who believe what he says. Let's just, let's just confirm that point with our final scripture quote. This time from the New Testament, from the writings of the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Coming in at verse 20, reading from verse 20 to verse 28. But now Christ is risen from the dead. That man who was crucified, cruelly slain by his enemies, rose from death and rose into the heavens to be seated there until the Lord sends him back. Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So Christ is just the first fruits to rise from the dead. There will be many, uh, many who, ha who have believed in him, believed in this uh, grand and glorious purpose that the, 
uh, the Lord God has to fill the earth with his family. They too will be raised at that time, at the last day, John chapter 5, John chapter 6. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. That's all who are in Christ. Each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterwards those that are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end. And so there's the kingdom age then, when the Lord Jesus rules. Um, the scriptures indicate for a thousand years. Then comes the end. The end of that kingdom age. When he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. When he puts an end to all rule, all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet. That's God then has put all things under the feet, the rulership, the dominion of the Lord Jesus. But when he says all things are put under him, it's evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now, when all things are made subject to him, to the Lord Jesus, then the Son himself, will also be subject to him who put all things on them, that God might be all and in all. And here it is then, the ultimate purpose of God, to restore again this creation, this world in which we live, to that great purpose for which it was established and created in the first place, that God can dwell in fellowship with men. And the earth can be filled truly with a family who are like him, like the God who created them. So thank you for listening to this talk. And we hope that you will join us for other talks in this series. God bless you all. Amen and amen. May we all live to see the time of Jesus' return, for it is near.